Speaking of excellent speakers, we have Elaine Neal Orr with us today. Elaine is the author of Gods of Noonday, A White Girl's African Life, and is an, in, and is an award-winning teacher at NC State University. Her short memoirs and short fiction have appeared in Shenandoah, the Missouri Review, the Louisville Review, Image, and Southern Cultures. So the topic of today's discussion is going to be on memoir writing, putting your words uh, into a book. How, how, do, how do you put your <coughs> life into a book? Um, and so the format for this is we're going to start with uh, probably about five questions that I have prepared here and then I'm sure we're going to have some excellent questions from you all so we'll, we'll get to those after this, this opening five questions. And the main thing I want to emphasize is that I want to make sure that everybody who has a question gets the opportunity to ask a question. So we'll seat belt Elaine in uh, and not let her leave and she's going to answer all the questions here today because she is the expert. And I'd like to thank you all for coming. First to get things started, how many folks uh, are completed with their memoir? Let me get a sense of that. How many folks have finished oh. your, your writing and are looking for a publisher? How many people have not begun it but want to write a memoir? So I take it that the rest uh, have started their memoir somewhere uh, in the process of completing it. Uh, today's topic is memoir writing and we have a lot of folks in attendance who have ideas for and want to publish their memoirs. How would you, Elaine, characterize the state of memoir publishing in 2008? Um, <clears throat> how would I describe the state of memoir publishing? Well, I think it's still really, yeah, excuse my voice, I, it's just a little, I was ill too, but coming out of it, so my voice is just a little uh, rough. Um, I think it's still very, um, good. The, the, um, I think it's probably easier at right now to publish memoir than fiction. Um, and, you know, I think when I, my memoir first came out in 2003 and then um, in, in paper in 2005, and I was told that I was sort of on the, the, the end of the wave, you know, <laughs> that um, this couldn't sustain itself. People <coughs> would not keep buying memoir. They wouldn't continue to be interested in it. I think that's uh, very false from the editors I've talked with and the presses I look at. So I think it's still a really strong market and if you're, uh, if you're interested in writing memoir, you should be writing memoir. And part of my attitude about everything I've done in life is that some if I write a book it'll get published. You know, <laughs> I mean if you, I, I, I don't, if I, when I was finishing my PhD everyone said you won't get a job, but I did. So I just think you write, <laughs> with a, a faith in what you're doing and and don't be deterred by what you might be hearing about how hard it is. Um, it's worthwhile, even if it's hard. To, to me, it seems like one of the keys of an extraordinary memoir is empathy. Can you speak to what the role of compassion and empathy is in your writing and in general, in, in memoir writing in general? Um, well, I can say this, that my parents came off better in my book than they really would have in life. <laughs> so, I mean, I think that um, I had, I learned actually more about their, their story uh, through writing about mine. And um, I do think that um, a kind of compassion and um, even love for uh, your material, which includes the people um, who are in your life, who, who either in the past or the present, uh, the people you're writing about. Um, it's, I think it's really important in memoir um, that, we, that we, we don't be perceived as writing uh, to get back at someone or you know, to set the record straight, but really to learn something about ourselves. And maybe that's the person you should be most compassionate toward, mm. is yourself, the story you want to tell, the way you know it. I really shielded myself from a lot of people, including peop the, the kids I grew up with in boarding school especially. Um, and wouldn't talk to them um, as I was writing because I thought this is my story and I don't want it to get entangled with or refuted by someone until it's published. Um, so that's a great question. I wouldn't have thought of that. But 
Well, it, it seems like this is one of the things that I'm learning as a writer, and I'm sure m many of you have thought about, is, is, is developing an emotional compassion before you begin to write. Uh, and that sort of segues nicely uh, into my next question, which is, uh, how do you prepare yourself emotionally each day when you sit down to write? Do you try to put yourself into a specific emotional mood, or do you just write from whatever mood you happen to be in that day? Well, um, when I'm able to write daily, which is in the summer, or if I go off to the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts, or where someone's fixing all my meals, um, then, uh, you know, I really get submerged in my work, and it, it comes before almost everything. Um, during the school year, I'm a professor at NC State, you mentioned that maybe. Um, I'm not able to write every day, uh, maybe every three or four days. I mean, every maybe three or four days out of the week. And uh, even if it's just for an hour. And I, I don't think I can demand a mood in order to write, although I have begun to do some corny things, like light a candle, um, play some really corny sort of new age music. Uh, to kind of get myself relaxed, and then, um, and then start writing because it's time to write. You know, it's ten in the morning or whatever, and uh, that's you're the time you set a, um, apart to write. And what happens with me, and I hope it happens with you, is as soon as I settle in and start writing, I get really excited. Um, and it's 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 sort of like I'm taking yoga right now, and now that it's getting dark. I have to go out in the dark to do yoga in the evening. It takes a lot of courage, and I think, no, I'll just stay home. It's it's warm here, you know. And so, uh, I think that's a, there's something of an analogy there. You still you just you have to show up, and then when you start doing it, it feels really really good. Hmm. Yeah. And ask me a question that gets let, allows me to read something briefly. Okay. Well. <laughs> like well, again, we have Elaine Neal Orr, who is the author of. Gods of Noonday. Can we get all together say, Gods of Noonday? There we go. Uh, would you like to read a little bit from I Gods would. of Noonday? <laughs> wow, I was hoping you would ask that. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, this memoir was, um, I, I'd always wanted to write about my life in Nigeria, uh, which is where I was born. I have Yorba names. And my first landscape, all my sensory perceptions uh, were are grounded in Nigeria. I mean, Nigeria is really my home. But because I'm white and sound fairly Southern, um, no one would recognize me as being different. And when I came to the U.S. and had to go to high school and act like a white girl from, well, actually it was in Arkansas, um, I, it was like a part of me went underground. And it wasn't until I wrote this memoir that I, that I really felt that I had um, been allowed to speak, to really tell my story. And um, something else I wanted to say there, let's see if I can retrieve it. Um, I can't, but maybe I will in a moment. So, um, oh, I know, the precipitating event, though, for why I did it when I did it, well, there were two. I'd become a full professor and I'd published enough scholarly work so I could do what I wanted. Mm -hmm. That was a biggie. But the next thing was that I was diagnosed with end-stage renal disease. And um, I, it seemed like this is a good time to start, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> and so um, I was propelled into writing by that event. And so I'll just read very, very briefly the beginning and you'll see that um, it starts at Duke Medical Center. To get to the clinic from the parking lot at Duke Medical Center, you can walk through an enclosed elevated passageway, or you can stay outside, cross the street, and walk on the concrete path until you get to the clinic and enter. I choose the outdoor path, even though at 9.30 a.m. the temperature is nearing 85 degrees and I can feel the heat strobing up around my feet. I always prefer to walk outdoors. Here I can see the dignified stone buildings and the yellow daylilies and feel a sudden breeze that lifts my hair. 
I can almost believe I'm in Africa. Two men sit on a bench and I know they will watch me as I pass. I don't look sick and I always walk with purpose as my father taught me. So I imagine they think I am visiting some other less lucky person, but I am the patient reporting for a visit with the transplant doctor. I like Dr. Collins. He's, an Af he's African American and his face is handsome and kind. Everything about him is balanced. He is not in a hurry. So I wait for the requisite 15 minutes, have my blood drawn, wait some more, see Dr. Collins who answers a few questions I've jotted down, and then I'm on my way, cleared to remain on the list, that awful, wonderful list that ensures you can have a transplant. As I leave the clinic, walking back out into the summer light, I am blinded for a moment. And in that brief disorientation, I hear a voice, sharp and full, like a series of musical notes. It seems to come from the air above me, but it is actually behind, and I turn quickly, stumbling as I look back. The woman almost runs into me. She is dressed entirely in yellow, a yellow print blouse with puff sleeves that are cut out just at the shoulders so that her brown skin shows through. A solid yellow wrap, even yellow sandals, though her feet at the back spill over, and she is large, not just in her body, but in her manner. I smile, and she smiles back quickly before calling out again. As she passes, I see she is hailing her son who has gone out before us and is running down the path. She half runs after him, though she seems almost to be in slow motion, her arms lifting into the air and coming back down like wings of a huge monarch butterfly. I pick up my pace because I want to hear her voice again. As she approaches the child, one arm goes out before her and she swoops him up laughing, and as she hoists him to her shoulder, his face is down toward me and he is absolutely delighted. Now she stands and waits because there are others in her par party coming up behind us. When I reach her, I stop ostensibly to admire the boy, but what I want really is to make her speak to hear her voice again. Where are you from? I ask directly, for this is what I have learned to do in North Carolina when I hear someone from West Africa. She answers, we live in Cary. <laughs> but this isn't what I want. No, I correct her. Where are you from originally? I am from Africa. She says, only it comes out with an emphasis on the A. Still, she doesn't take me seriously. No, I venture more sternly this time. What country? And now she's relaxing. <coughs> she touches her face. I am from Nigeria. She draws it out. Tears come to my eyes, and then my body warms as if I have had a transfusion. I know, I tell her, I was born in Abomashaw. Every Nigerian knows Abomashaw in Yoruba land. How about a round of applause, folks? <laughs> What is your most vivid memory that you have from your childhood in Africa? Sitting in a guava tree and swimming in a river. Hmm. I sat in the guava tree when I was three and that's where I, you know, sort of hid and watched the world. Guava trees are probably about the size of a small dogwood. So I thought I was white, you know, quite high in the air. Um, my nursemaid had probably perched me up there. I, I don't even know if I could have climbed it. And then swimming in this river, the Ethiop River, in another part of Nigeria where my family m later moved. My parents were missionaries. And um, 
the thing is, again, that um, I think what sticks with us sometimes most profoundly from childhood is physical memory. Um, don't you think? It's memory about what you ate or your backyard or a river you swam in. Um, and that's what makes you who you are. And I, I think, for me, I was 16 when I left Nigeria, so all of that had been so firmly established in my mind. I, I, I will tell you also, though, I had a kind of Proustian moment. Where's my student who read Proust? There she is. Um, about three days ago, I was at my son's house and I wanted a snack and he said, well, we have some peanut butter and graham crackers. And I made myself a little peanut butter and graham cracker and I remembered in a flash, being two and a half or three years old, set up in, on, on top of the kitchen counter in Nigeria by my nursemaid and fed graham crackers and peanut butter. Hmm. I think the more, the deeper you go, the more you remember. You will remember things you had forgotten as you write. Or if you've already done this, you know that. What would you say that you love most about Africa? Well, that's a little difficult because I have been back three times recently. And now I'm really establishing friendships and with people I didn't as a child. And so um, right now, I guess what's Fav my favorite thing is my friends the, uh, with whom I correspond and vi um, visit. Um, now the question was, what do I love most about Africa? Mm. Well, you know, you all know this is Nigeria's in West Africa, so it's not Kenya. I can't talk about the animals. Um, I think it, what I love the most is a sense of community life and the, 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 this sounds so cliched, but the sounds of joy and, and music that come out of every Nigerian home and every marketplace, regardless of your level of wealth or poverty. Nigerians on average make $300 a year. My son went with me last November to Nigeria and he said, I've never seen happier people. That was what most impressed him, hmm. was the joy that people have and the openness um, and generosity. Um, no nuclear homes, you know. <laughs> um, no, not knowing your neighbors in Nigeria. Hmm. Can you discuss the, the healing effects of writing Gods of Noonday? How did it affect you psychologically and physically? Um, it was one of the most joyful experiences of my life because I get, got to go back to Nigeria in my mind. Um, and I was on dialysis um, for two and a half years as I worked on the book and um, had a transplant, two transplants actually, and then finished the book. And um, so... <coughs> Writing literally sustained me during that illness. And, but the other thing that sustained me was that I kept my job at NC State and I kept going to work and teaching students. And getting up in the morning and becoming a human being is a pretty important thing to do um, if you want to keep on living, right? And so I had to because I was teaching. So, but, but Gods of Noonday was... Um, I think it is very much about healing. All the way through the book, sort of the, the spine of the book is my present life and my illness. Mm -hmm. uh, like the Duke, Duke section, that's the spine of the book. And then all the Nigerian me memories loop down from that. Mm -hmm. So that only rarely do I come back to North Carolina, but I do occasionally. And every time I do, my health is worse. But as long as I was writing, it, which took me right up to the transplants. I knew I couldn't die. You know, um, I, I believe that as long as you're writing, you can't die. That's my new idea. <laughs> and um, which was borne out in this book. So um, the greatest healing, though, was, was not the transplants, really. Um, although, you know, what an incredible gift 
it is to get a transplant. But the healing was that I learned who I really am by writing this memoir. Um, I don't think I had, that it had been a long time, 40 odd years in the US, um, maybe not, maybe 35 before I um, wrote this, not this memoir. So I felt actually, I'm gonna contradict myself and say that when I had finished the draft, I thought I can die. I don't, I don't care if I die really. I've written the book that is may, maybe the, at that point I thought it was the most important thing I'd ever done. I do want to talk a little bit about process and, and the comment about how you framed this is, is one of the questions that I have here. Uh, but one question before we get to process, uh, one last question before we get to process, what do you think it is about place mm -hmm. that is so important to you? Why is, why is that important to you? Um, you know, Eudora Welty, I think, said that place is everything, or something close to that. Um, a lot of Southern writers, and I'm sure writers from other places, Kathleen Norris has a, a memoir called Dakota. It's absolutely about Dakota. Um, for, so, so, but Southern writers, I think in particular, are aware of this, and I don't know that it, whether it was my Southernness or just the fact that I grew up in Nigeria, but Place is a character. Place is, I think, needs as much attention in a memoir, maybe even more, than, the, than some other characters. Um, and every place can be incredibly interesting. It, it, you don't need to have grown up in Nigeria. Um, talking about walking up to the 7-Eleven to get a slushie, you know, from your whatever neighborhood you lived in in the 70s and, um, you know, though every, everything is wonderful material, but um, I would pay a lot of attention to place. Um, if there are any particular colloquialisms, language, um, that, you know, that helps you create that sense of place, um, that's, a, that's a wonderful way to sort of bridge place and character um, and, and pay a lot of attention to both. <coughs> I have a few uh, questions on writing process and then we'll take questions uh, from everybody here as well. I do have a sign-in sheet uh, that I'd like to pass around. We do events all the time. We have at least one event per month here at Quail Ridge sort of geared towards the writing process and the publishing process as well. Uh, so I'll get this uh, sign-in sheet. If you, if you want to find out about future events that we're doing, uh, please do sign in your name and email address. Uh, so a couple of questions on the writing process uh, and then we'll open the floor to questions from, uh, from everybody here today. Uh, so let's talk about the writing process. Uh, first, how long did it take to write Gods of Noonday? I think I started in 97, um, but then for a year I didn't write at all because of some other things that were not health related that were going on in my life. And I came back to it in, um, let's say, uh, around 99 and finished it by maybe 2001 or 2002. Um, numerous, numerous revisions. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're gonna get to that, but. Um, so so I would say it took about, and of course it takes a year with, the University of Virginia Press published my book. It takes them a year. I don't know about, a lot of presses take almost a year. So if you so it took longer for it to actually be it out. Sure. But but I'd say three years to write. Did you outline for the book? No. Um, I wrote my Nigerian life first. I, originally, I wasn't even going to put in the furloughs in the U.S. because I'm. Because I love Nigeria so much, and I don't love the U.S. as much as I love Nigeria. And I thought, I'm not even going to write those furlough years. They're, but of course they were important to me and who I am and my family. So I did, um, after encouragement for some, from some readers, um, put th those chapters in. Um, I write pretty organically. Um, but one thing I did that I didn't mention when I was talking about writing the book mm -hmm. is even before I started writing the book, I would just write scenes in my journal. And um, I was writing it in my journal every day and I would write two or three pages about something that happened as a child or in my early life. 
And then when it was try time to actually write the memoir, I had all these huge sections written in my journal that I could just basically lift out and type. And by the I don't know if anyone's told you all this, but retyping is a great way to write and make your writing better. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I actually retyped and um, and, and but, but even before that, I just uh, took things wholesale out of my journal. Um, but I did not have, I, I mean, I sort of had a chronology because of my life. Um, I, was, I was pretty much going to follow that. Um, and it was later that I came in and put the scaffolding in about um, my illness. Um, so I, I might be straying from your question. What was it? Well, just to do the outline. Did I have an outline? <coughs> but that segues into the next question, which is could you discuss the framework for how you've written Gods of Noonday, specifically how you've interwoven uh, your youth with your adulthood and the illness that you've discussed? Uh, one of the questions, I didn't write this out because I, th I thought it sounded a little bit too abrasive, but I'll put it here since we're feeling a little bit more comfortable now. What, what do you think the purpose of framing a book like that is? What, what is the effect that it has like on the reader? Like framing it with the illness? Yes, going back and forth. What, what well, I mean, I think it's a, um, I think it's a calcul. Th th there's some risk to it, so it's uh, something of a calculated risk, I guess. But um, for me, I, I thought it might um, provide a sense of urgency to the narrative um, that I was writing with this illness. And because my writing style can tend to be, and I think this is a good thing, uh, sort of, is the word, not laconic, um, languorous. Uh, someone wrote a review of my book and said it was la languorous. And I was like, well, that's good, right? But actually, he didn't mean that. <laughs> and um, so, uh, so having that tight framework that runs throughout and is a kind of backbone, um, I think gave a, much more of a sense of movement and, and urgency to writing that could still in many places be extremely slow and deep and go deep into place and feeling. Um, so I, for me, I thought that worked. You see that, that framework a lot in suspense novels of all things, you know, the framework of moving from one character's perspective to the next in the form of fiction. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it works psychologically very similarly in, what's the title again? Gods God. of Noonday. Noonday. All right, now that everybody's warmed up, let's do that one more time, that was kind of weak. One more time. <laughs> Gods God. of Noonday. Noonday. All right, so do you guys have any questions uh, for Elaine today? I have a question over here, yes ma'am. Because I have a three-year-old grandson who is always asking me, no matter, we sit down in the car, get ready to go, Nana, tell me about things that happened when mm -hmm. you were a little girl. And so I decided that's why I wanted to write a memoir. But that made me wonder, what does your son think of this? How has it affected him? And what, is he grateful that he did this? For, for him? Grateful, no. <laughs> Let me repeat the <laughs> Let me repeat the question. So the question, in case you couldn't hear it, was, what does your son think about the book. No. Well, I think and you were probably thinking about your own family and how they would feel maybe about yeah. your book. Okay, first of all, I think it's fantastic that you're telling these stories and I hope you're writing, going ahead and writing them down and embellishing them. Um, <laughs> well, now I didn't mean, you know, <laughs> making things up. I just mean, what was most, Im I think the one thing that was most important to me in writing, I'll get to your question, um, was the quality of the language. You know, so that's what I, I really mean, embellish it stylistically. Um, so are we still, we're still on this question of my son. Um, uh, it's not that my son is so much in this memoir, but that um, I don't know how to make him, I don't know how to speak for him. Um, hmm. Well, let me say, what would you think we might be nice for your grandchildren or something? There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, th I think the, um, the, the immediate, you know, the child right in front of you might, might be thinking, well, Mom, you know, you could have come to that last play I was in or something like that. I don't know, but grandchildren, I think, would likely be quite intrigued and love it and be very proud of you. And I don't think that my son's not proud of me, but I'm not sure that this memoir is the primary reason. So, 
my husband, incredibly supportive, very supportive, and read the book toward the end. I didn't have him read it as I was moving, and was extremely excited about it. it goes to book events with me, and my parents um, have been very supportive. Although I don't think my mother would have chosen the portrait I give her in the book. I think you have to write it. You have to tell the truth. That doesn't mean you have to make everyone look as just like you felt about them when you were in the ninth gr grade or something. But um, I, I think that uh, Getting it straight for your sake is is really important. We have a question, Hannah. Um, how did you manage to balance everything between the teaching, having a family, you know, all the mundane tasks, take care of a home, preparing for classes, and dealing with a serious illness, and the time you couldn't have high energy level throughout all that when it would really, you know, bottom out? Would you write on those days? Or would you take those? Days or I'm sorry, the last part I didn't hear. Would I do what? When, you're, when your energy would be depleted. Cause right. Days depleted, depleted right. Your illness. Did you rest those days? Or what, <coughs> right. I'm curious how you managed all of right. that. Right. I'm very hard-headed. Um, and and um, it, 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 you're right. Uh, being on, I was on um, ambulatory... I don't even remember the name of it. I was on dialysis that you do, you do yourself at home four times a day. So it did mean I had to sit down four times a day to do that. That gave me time. And I would do it in front of the computer, usually. Um, a lot of things become quite insignificant when you're writing a book and you're ill. I was not doing any redecorating, <laughs> you know. Of course, I still had to go to work, but my students were a source of inspiration. Um, I think you have to have a routine. Um, I really do. And the recently I've been really frustrated because I'm not able to get back to the novel I'm, I've been writing as much as I would like. And um, But I thought, okay, a year ago, where was I? Well, now I'm a lot further along. If I think about, well, where was I in the fall, early fall, well, I haven't made that much progress. But if I think about the whole year, I've made a lot of progress. So I think it's um, right at least uh, briefly um, four or five days a week. And for me, the best time is in the morning before the world comes in. Absolutely get, don't turn on your internet. You know, don't check email. Your whole day will be lost, you know. And... Um, and I became pretty, um, I would say, um, my son was mostly grown. He was in high school, uh, I guess. Uh, and I think that um, it, as long as, if you can get into that sort of quiet space early in the day, some people, I guess, work at night. But oh, I know what I was going to say. I became pretty stern about what I would do for anyone. So I found, I found ways in every part of my life to be more careful about my time. Yeah. Uh, some, some things... Um, in turn, for example, teaching or doing my job, I did exactly what had to be done. I didn't volunteer for committees. You know, it was really this was staying alive and writing this book um, were my priorities. Christine? Hi, thank you so much for this uh, presentation, both of you. And um, I do understand. Uh, the motivations in you personally as a person mm -hmm. and as a writer to mm -hmm. write. Uh, what um, was your, your motivation or your, your desire to then put it into a book format and to mm -hmm. share with the rest of the world? Um, I'm so glad you asked that because if you hadn't I may not have remembered to say this. Um, I wanted to write a book for Nigeria, not just for me. Um, because Nigeria is portrayed so negatively 
in the press, and it's the country I love. And I did a huge amount of research into the Biafran War, all kinds of things about Nigeria that I had not known before. Um, I, I read traditional religion. I read the geography. I learned the maps. Um, I learned uh, about the politics and the history uh, beginning in the 19th century. So uh, this t the, a major reason I wanted this book to be published was for Nigeria and, and to have a really different portrait. Um, but I do want to emphasize again that I think it can be, it, you don't have to have anything quite this odd, <laughs> a life like mine, um, for your story to be worthy of publication. You know, I think it has everything to do with um, the beauty of your language, um, the way you make it available to readers, the way you structure it. Um, so, I would say if you're going to write a memoir, publish it. Try to publish it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, but I think also from what you're saying and the way you're saying it, I mean, you're conveying emotion. And yes, we write for ourselves. That's the primary motivation and mover. But also, we, we have to be of service. Otherwise, there's no reason why we have to reach out to an audience, let alone a, a world audience. Right. And the way you said you wanted to write a book from Nigeria, and the way you talked about this country you love, is moving to me. And, and I can relate to today's because I am French, and I'm writing a memoir, and it starts in France, and I also want to write my book for France in some way. Yeah. So uh, I think that, that each of us, we have to come in touch listening to you, I realize that we have to come in touch with the grander design. Uh, once we step outside of our own personal mm -hmm. story, mm -hmm. and it's written, I mean, or, or maybe somewhere in the middle of the process, we have to connect to what's the grander reason. I really appreciate that. And, and um, one thing that, um, that I uh, did while I was writing was I went back and read the Nigerian newspaper when I was growing up, um, I, I tried to take my back, myself back to, the, um, to some of the conflicts that were going on at that point that I didn't even know about. Um, or I felt there was a sense of conflict, but I wasn't sure what it was, that like, for example, when the war was about to break out. Um, and I like your idea of service and the larger vision. Um, I, I don't want to let go, though, of the idea that you're comprehending who you are out of a series of, out of your life experience is valuable. And I'll, one other thing along these lines, as I did the historical research, and again, you can do historical research on Raleigh, right? I mean, any, anywhere you want your, your story is set. Um, I came to understand how many things in my life that I thought were personal were actually global and political. Mm -hmm. And I really encourage you, if you're writing a memoir, <coughs> to research the historical period in which your life occurred, and your parents perhaps, mm -hmm. and the place and the politics that brought that place into being. Because again, it doesn't have to be in Africa, it can be here in the South. Um, who wrote that memoir, Blood Done Sign My Name? Which is, takes place here in, in um, North Carolina. And of course that was a pretty large event but, that he was talking about. But um, I'll just give you a couple of I I I examples of what I learned. Um, I remember my parents being, um, beginning to, to to express some anxiety about their work in the Baptist Hospital. This was when I was about eight or nine. And um, I didn't know until um, my, I talked with my mother that the concern or what was happening was that American newspapers about the civil rights movement and uh, Newsweeks and Time magazines were getting, were being brought to, the, to Nigeria and their students were, re the nursing students were reading these and they were ready to rebel against the missionaries because they saw pictures of 
policemen in the U.S. beating up black people. And they, so they were saying to my parents, how can you, how can you teach us when your own country doesn't know how to treat people, right? And so there were just all these incredible juxtapositions, political and personal, that I learned um, in the process <coughs> of writing this book. And I think it speaks to one of the questions that I mentioned early on, you know, beginning with this sort of empathy and, and love in your mind about the project. I think that'll sustain a project in a way that, you know, resentment or a chip on your shoulder is, is likely not to. I think, I think looking back at my writing career so far, I've been banging my head against the wall. I think I've finally kind of figured out what you're speaking to, Christine, and what you're talking about, and that is, You've really got to, you've got to love the characters that you're writing about, the place that you're writing about, and it has to be, I think, in just a pure place to begin with. So, yes? One of the struggles that I'm having is that it, it seems like such an overwhelming task, and part of it is that I've waited until almost 60 to start it. There's a lot of years there, but also, did you, did you hone in on more the chronological story, the psychological story? Do you deal with your spiritual journey? Mm -hmm. I mean, how do, you, how do you narrow it down? Well, I did, you're saying you're starting a memoir and you're 60. I don't know if you're planning to write all 60 years. Exactly. <clears throat> okay, I wrote about the first 16 years of my life in Nigeria, and then I, ha and I wrote about my present life and this illness and I didn't try to go further than age 16. That was what I wanted to capture, because that was Nigeria. So I would urge you to do that. And then I think that um, as you're writing and you're working within that chronology, if that's what you're doing, um, you'll begin to know where, I think, to go deeper and what to excavate. Um, and you'll have a, a clearer sense of the shape that the story's moving in. But I recommend, I don't know if you're in a writing group, it's fantastic if you have a writing group and someone can read it and say, well, why don't you pull this scene up because this really gets my attention. Um, or um, this, this material here seems kind of self-indulgent, you know. Because one thing I did learn writing a memoir, just because it happens to you doesn't make it interesting. Okay, so on the one hand, everything can be interesting, but it's not automatically interesting because it's your life. Um, so, I, as I said, I tend not to be, even though I was following the chronology of my life, I tend to be a writer because I think I might be mostly naturally a poet who goes pretty deep in, with scene and uh, my, so my, my memoir doesn't just kind of move along at a great, great pace. And that, so it was in moments where I went deeper that I could excavate what this meant for me psychologically and, and spiritually and, um, and I don't think, I, I didn't ever sort of announce that that was what I was doing. Like, okay, now let me tell you about in the eighth grade what my emotional life was like. Um, it's, in, it's in the way that you treat the material then and, and let us know who you were then and all the thousands of choices you're going to make about what's important to put in. And sometimes an emblem can stand for a lot. You can choose one thing and it can stand for a lot um, of a lot more. It's, yeah. an, it's an excellent question. It makes me wonder if there was a theme or a central story arc that you saw initially that you wanted to tell. You, you had to select time. That was a framework to begin with. Right. You wanted to write about the first 16 years. But was there, was there sort of a theme underlying it that you wanted to convey? Unfortunately, I think I was a person who thought my life was interesting just before I, just because I'd lived it to begin with. <laughs> and so I didn't really have a sense of theme. It was like Elaine's life. You know, aren't you interested? Um, and I think that, I, but I do think that as I was writing, the, the, the desire to write about Nigeria in a positive light emerged. Um, 
tell me again, what were some of the key questions? Key co I, I, I keep going off on a different tangent from what you've asked. Well, just whether there was a theme. It sounds like the theme right. became the love for Nigeria, but that, that evolved as, as you were writing it. Right. Um, actually, I think that was sort of there from the beginning, the theme of Nigeria mm -hmm. and loving Nigeria. I think that was already there. And I think the other major impetus was telling the truth about my life and what each year of my life, or you know, chunks of my life had been like. Um, so the theme of, um, there is a theme of loss of health and regaining health in the story, in the memoir, and basically what I say, and I believe this to more than some extent, I, be I believe it to a pretty significant extent, okay? Mm -hmm. That my declining health was related to losing my interior self and losing my country of origin. That I really became sick out of that break. And, and I, I wrote out of that understanding that my illness was largely about loss, uh, the loss of a homeland, the loss of a family, the loss of people I loved, and eventually the loss of, of a working, operating body. Um, so I, I, I think the theme of, of, of um, declining health and, and, and even declining spiritual health and then the reclamation of both physical mm. and spiritual health yeah. is a huge, the huge story of the memoir. I do think I worked at it more organically. I, I, that's the kind of writer I am. It sounds like a big part of it was realigning yourself with the things that mattered and getting right. a better sense of, of what mattered in your life. Right. Um, other questions? Yes. So the question was, if you couldn't hear it, uh, in the back was, how did, how did you get started? Uh, and if I can sort of segue as well, uh, perhaps address some of the publications that you had had in, in these literary journals uh, that I had mentioned at the introduction. Um, when I was an MA student at the University of Louisville, oh, some years ago, um, <laughs> I took two poetry writing classes, and I loved them. And I actually went, to, I actually went was considering doing an MA thesis in poetry. Th they didn't have an MFA then. Um, but I, I was really, I would say, seduced by scholarship, and I r decided I really wanted to have a scholarly life. But I kept writing poetry for uh, two decades. Yeah, two decades <laughs> almost. And um, when I finished my scholarly books and, and didn't have to write anymore, um, I decided to write this memoir and I had never written any CNF. I'd never written memoir, I'd never written creative nonfiction. I hadn't even read that much. Um, but I was compelled to write it. And um, I wrote it really out of um, relationships with a lot of other texts. Yeah, Could but 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 the oh so the the journals uh, everything I've published it creatively except four poems out of my MA years I guess maybe six poems I published six creative writing poems at my at the MA level I didn't return to creative writing except poetry that I was sort of hiding mm -hmm. um, until I wrote this memoir and this is the first thing I wrote I didn't write. A short memoir. I didn't write short fiction, and now in the past, since mm -hmm. I don't know, the past three years, I've sort of um, apprenticed myself to fiction writing, and have just because I wanted to learned how to write fiction, and um, and we're someone could have told me to start with an easy novel, but I chose an historical novel set in 1855 in Nigeria. Um, so. Uh, so the, the things that are now that I'm now publishing are post memoir. I wrote the memoir, and then everything else that I've written has come after that. What advice would you give to folks about you? You've published uh, short memoirs 
and short fiction since publishing Gods of Noonday in Shenandoah, the Missouri Review, the Louisville Review, Image, and Southern Cultures. What advice would you give to folks who seek publication in literary journals uh, like these? First, get feedback here in Raleigh. Find readers um, so that you get some response and you can perfect your, your craft. Um, I did have some readers. So I would say that's the, the first thing. The other thing is you start reading literary journals. You start reading these places. Mm -hmm. um, and you can come into Nancy's store and buy copies, you know, so you don't have to get a whole subscription. She's very wonderful in having that journal section in the back of the store, which doesn't pay off for her, I don't think. Um, I don't think it's her, her most lucrative business, okay? So if you could go back there <laughs> and buy a literary journal, that would be a great thing to do. And read several and maybe um, enter a couple of competitions because you get a free journal and what have you lost? Um, and so those are, those are two things I would strong, strongly recommend. And then when you, then you just take the risk of sending things out. I, I just told someone this yesterday or the day before. I have a friend who says she's not doing her job as a writer and she's a vice president of Emory University and has two children. She says she's not doing her job as a writer. She doesn't get a rejection letter at least one a week. So when you go to the mailbox and there's the rejection letter, letter it's a reassurance. You see that you're doing your job. <laughs> That's one place you're not, it's, it's like you've just found out out of the 200 places you might send it where it's not going to go, right? So you go right back <laughs> and you send it out somewhere else and you keep and you double submit um, all the time. That's an advantage we have over academic writing. You can't double submit. Creative writing, you know, uh, s I, and I don't submit to the places that say don't. Mm. Um, but most places now are saying yes. And I would say be prepared to send it out 20 or 30 times. Well, it's just at four. I want to, if we have enough questions, and I'm sure we'll have some more questions, uh, push this until 4.15. So we've got about 15 or 16 minutes here to take some more questions uh, from the audience here in the middle. Um, I think you alluded to this before about allowing other people to read uh, your work. Um, did you let them read it in chunks or, um, and the other question, a uh, second question mm -hmm. was, um, since you're writing about people that you know, did you get their permission? Did you tell them that you were going to write about them? Before no, I didn't do that. And if I were going to write a second memoir, I think I would change the names, except for mine, though no one has sued me. Um, I didn't get any permissions. I did all of this rather naively. Um, and your first question, though, is... Allowing others to read it. Allowing others to read it, yes, but I only chose people who, I didn't have that many people who read it, maybe six or so. Um, I wouldn't allow anyone to read it who would have an agenda against my writing when I was writing. You know, I didn't show it to my parents early on um, and, or, or anyone I grew up with. Um, and, I, and I generally had other writers reading for me, so I got good advice about the writing, about the writing itself. Yeah, but um, I guess, you, you know, depending on sort of the, what's going to be in your memoir, you, you may want to get permission. I didn't. Well, I'm doing the change, change the location, change Oh, the you're changing location. everything, okay. And, and, and well, I don't see why you should need to get um, <laughs> permission then if you're, if you're not using the same names and it's in a different place. That's, yeah. a th that's a good place for me to, to plug our critique group. We do have a, a critique group with the Raleigh Right to Publish group that meets at Cameron Village once a month. That's headed by Sharon Wood. Um, if you've, uh, where's the, the sign-in sheet? Has, that, has everybody had the opportunity to sign in on the sign-in sheet that, that hasn't? I see one person shaking their head uh, in the back. And if you sign in there, then I can let you know about our critique group when we have that. I'm on your list twice, so. so. <laughs> All righty. But I'm not far enough along that I feel that I'm ready to be critiqued. Do we have yeah, any? Well, then don't. I mean, go further. Do we have any questions over here uh, from this side? I'm not always leaning forward the way I should, I guess. Yes, sir. 
when you talk about writing and you go deep, mm -hmm. what's it like when you come back out for the rest of your day in relationships, and how does that affect your writing the next time you go? Well, for the most part, my writing makes me happy. I probably think it's better than it is. And so, um, so when I write, and if I go deeply into something and discover something about myself, I'm ecstatic. I'm thrilled. I mean, and that's when things start to happen that, you, you, and you're sure there. It may, I don't know about a god, but at least gods running around because you start going deeper, and things clarify, and you learn. Uh, th things come to you from places you didn't expect them to come. Um, people will show up and tell you things and it's not because they're in your family those aren't you know you know that part of the story um but just well you know you're in the groove when things start coming to you and i'll, I'll give you an example although it's from the novel i'm writing um which is about this missionary couple first african first white missionaries to africa <coughs> sent by the southern baptist convention and um i had conjured a writing box for the heroine i had her unpublished diary and I had just decided she was going to have a writing box and I described it and I did you know the writing box was a big huge emblem it was really going to sort of carry the novel it's going to be this th emblem it was going to be there like you know you all know plum wine by Angela Davis Gardner her cabinet with the wine and you know this was my cabinet with the wine and um, last fall I went to Greensboro Georgia which is the home place of my heroine and I threw, I wandered into the florist shop, and lo and behold, the town historian was in the florist shop, and he told me about um, a relative of this woman that I'm writing about, and he said, I'll call her and you can go by her house, and so I did, and she, when I got there, she said, I've got many things I'm sure you'd like to see, and I bet you would love to see her writing box. <laughs> so that's what I mean. Things will come to you. And, um, but to go back to the question of how I felt, I did, th my work with this book was so intense that I would sometimes become almost disoriented. It was so deep in me and often so painful that when I, w that um, I could almost my mind would almost, when I tried to get back into the regular routine of life, I even had these experiences that I called time travel. I don't know what they were. But I would go out for a walk and I would seem to enter into a, another reality, um, another kind of, like, like I would almost have a glimpse of something that I couldn't quite grasp. And I would become physically ill. <coughs> so I, I think when you're really writing, there's, there is a lot of trauma, um, and start again the next morning, you know? It's, it's really kind of astonishing. It, it really makes you believe there's, the spirits aren't that far from us. In the middle here? When you talk about writing in your journal, do you, and you talk about taking things from your journal and putting them into book. Were you, do you do your journal writing by hand? Mm -hmm. in Absolutely. I do my journal writing by hand. There are these big black right. unlined books that you can find. And there, of course, there are journals here in this store. And um, yeah, I would write in longhand three or four pages often. Now, I, I'm not as um, wedded to my journal and that part of the process as I was with my memoir, but I always carry a little notebook so that if a good sentence comes into my head or I remember something, it's there when I go back the next morning. I mean, I have boxes of, of journals. Right. Well, do you, if the, are they dated? Yeah. If they're dated, I would say choose, choose what you most want to write about. Well, I haven't started to go back into okay. that. Okay. But I just was curious if that was how you write. Um, now, you write, I, now you write, I still... Do you write purposefully or do you write stream of consciousness or... Um, is one of is the first part of your question about sort of the mechanics of writing, like w whether I write on paper or on the computer, and then the second part was about 
about the, the other the right whether you're writing right right like the, what is it, um, I do know, write by hand I don't do that so much in my Pizza. journal <laughs> um, pizzas here <laughs> When, when I write in my journal, um, <coughs> I do use stream of consciousness. One idea just can lead to another, to another, to another. Although I will, like I said, at some points in that writing, I just developed whole scenes. Right. But um, and even now, say I'm away somewhere and I don't want to take my computer, I always have my notebook, and I'll, many of my short stories are begun longhand in a, a journal, and then I just go to my computer and type it in. But um, I would say I now do most of my writing on the computer. Um, and as far as, and, and, I, and when I'm working on the computer, I'm, I'm more strict with myself. Um, I don't just write stream of consciousness. Um, I, I shouldn't say that because James Joyce did and that was paid off well for him. <laughs> but you know, um, I try to have an idea of where I'm going. Although you don't know the end at all if you're writing fiction. But even with memoir, you don't know how you're going to end it. In my, in my own writing process, if I may, uh, I've developed uh, a routine and a framework. Uh, for each chapter, I write down who the POV character is going to be. Now, I write fiction. I don't write nonfiction. Uh, who the, the point of view character is going to be. Then I say, where are they at physically in the scene? Mm. You know, what is their physical setting? Where are they at emotionally at the beginning of the scene? And then where do I want them to go emotionally by the end of the scene? I also look at their, their, uh, their uh, external goal in the scene. What do they physically want to do in the scene? And then what are their internal goal? What is, what is the character's internal goal? And I do all of that chapter by chapter, as, but as I'm writing. I don't do it way in advance like some writers do. Oh, I see. But when I begin chapter one, I lay that out. And a lot of times a chapter will end a little bit differently than I first saw, but there's some sort of roadmap guiding me as I'm writing it. So, uh, yes, sir, here. Um, I, I noticed um, in a lot of memoirs, they, they have uh, each chapter is an event that tells a, a small story that, that ties into the bigger mm -hmm. story. And I was wondering, uh, with the transitions in chapters, how do you deal with that? in the sense of moving the story along and bringing the chapters together uh, in a memoir. Well, um... Can you repeat the question, please? The question was, uh, how, do you, how do you make transitions between chapters? What kinds of things do you use emotionally, perhaps, and then image-wise as well? Well, how a, do lo you a lot of the stories, um, um, you know, are, are many short stories that tie together to mm -hmm. contribute to the whole. Mm -hmm. I was trying to figure out the, the transition piece between the two, um, the chapters as, it, as they move along. Mm -hmm. Is, are you describing something that's, that's memoir but closer in structure to like a, a novel and stories, do you think? Not necessarily. No, it's, it's, still, it's still moving, each, each uh, chapter is contributing moving the story forward. Okay. But the, the events are different and you have to make some transitions to the next chapter to move on. So right. I'm trying to figure out, did you, you have that same issue? Well, I'll tell you what, I think I did, um, I, I think I did a lot, everything wrong, actually, um, because I didn't have, know what was going to happen in chapters. And in fact, I didn't even write in chapters. I just wrote. And at, at one point, I had three parts of my book, part one, part two, and part three, and they were on different separate discs. And the first was like, you know, birth to six years, and then elementary school, and then high school was sort of it. So I just had these big chunks. And then I went back in and made chapters. Um, but by chat, and I have quite a lot, like 46 in here, and, um, but I'll show you, uh, I just, maybe if I can find one real quickly. Well, it sounds like that time really plays sort of the central skeleton. That, that's piece. right. But see, here's a here's a chapter right there. 